Section 2.1, so this is on frequency distributions. So we have two things to talk about in this section. The first thing is we need to define frequency distributions. Frequency, not frequency. Distributions. And that means we need to talk about all the boring definitions, properties, and attributes of those distributions. <clears throat> and the second thing that we need to do is look at how to perform some calculations, calculations, with distributions. So, I do want to say that this first chapter is very dry. Uh, this is usually students least favorite chapter because there's a lot of definitions, a lot of terminology, but it's all necessary because none of the things we talk about in chapter two are ever going to go away. And you'll see these terms, these formulas, these properties all pop up over and over and over again as we continue through this semester. So bear with me in this first chapter. I know it's a lot of definitions and writing. Hopefully the note packets make it a little bit easier on your hands. I know they make it easier on my hands and we'll get through it. So the first definition we have is an ordered array. Now this one is relatively straightforward. An ordered array is just an ordered list. Least to greatest or greatest to least. doesn't matter. Sometimes you'll see things in either of these formats. Most often we want our data to be in an ordered array because it'll, it makes some of our calculations a little bit easier. So distributions are simply a way to describe the structure of a set of data. There are two main statistical distributions that we talk about. Uh, number one is frequency distribution, which is what this first section and chapter is focused on. And the second is probability distributions. So I want to define probability distributions first because we're going to be looking at those in a later chapter. So probability distribution is a theoretical distribution. Theoret theoretical meaning its contents, its data are theoretical data points, not actual data values that were collected. This The distribution itself is not theoretical. It exists. It's still, it's still a bunch of numbers, still an ordered array, uh, still a distribution. And this is used to predict probabilities. Specifically of data values occurring. And this is going to be our focus in chapter five, probability and probability distribution. So I just want to lay that definition out so you have an idea of what it is, but we are focused on frequency distributions in this class. So frequency distributions displays values of a data set and that's important there, the and, how often each value occurs. There are two main types of frequency distributions. There are ungrouped, And this is for small data sets. And there are grouped. This is for larger data sets. And we're just going to do a little compare and contrast for ungrouped versus grouped here.
So in an ungrouped distribution, each value that you see is a category. It's its own standalone category. Whereas in a group distribution, we have categories that represent multiple data values. So that's the, that's the big change. And you use these in different scenarios. So if I was looking at your grades in this class, I could do that both ungrouped and grouped. I could look at it ungrouped to see the actual scores, the percentages. And I could do a grouped version, which we'll look at an example of based on letter grade, for example. That would be categories. So let's flip the page here. So here we have an example. This is what I was talking about. We're going to do grades as the example. So first, let's look at the ungrouped distribution. And the ungrouped A, B, C, D, O, and F. So I know I just said this could be a grouped, but you can also think of this as ungrouped. So this is ungrouped if I'm only looking at your letter grade. Now, if I was looking at percentages and what those percentages letter grades corresponded to, that would be a grouping because I'd be grouping a range of values to your score. But our ungrouped distribution looks at these. These are what pop up. So if I was looking at a list of your names with your grades, I would just see these letters. And so we have five students, 12 students, nine students, four students and two students. And these are just numbers, they're not important. But this is ungrouped. Every, all I see in my distribution is A, B, C, D, and F. Whereas in a grouped distribution, we would be looking at something like test scores. And this would be the number that there are. And so we would see something like 90 to 100, 80 to 89, 70 to 79, 60 to 69, 50 to 59, and then I'm going to make one big group here, 0 to 49. And then we can divide these numbers a little, more, little bit more accurately. So we have 4, 8, 12, 6, 5, and two. No, these are not the same numbers exactly, but this is what I mean by group distribution. So I don't know what score these four people have, but I know that they all have at least 90 and at maximum 100. I don't know what score these five people have in this fifth category here, but I know that they all scored between 50 and 59. Whereas to contrast this with the grouped version over here, if I only care about the letter grade, the category, or not the category, if I only care about the letter grade, I don't need to know what score, what percentage these five people have. They all have A's. That's ultimately what matters. These 12 people all have B's. Whereas on a test score, sometimes if you're curving a test, you need to know how many people got eight, or how many people got 80 to 89, there's eight of them. How many people got 60 to 69, there's six of them. And we do some statistical work with that to develop those curves, which we will see in a, a later section, talk about how classes and exam scores get curved. But this is an example of grouped versus ungrouped. So we've been, I've been saying frequency a lot. So frequencies is simply the number of data values in a category. So you wouldn't look at each individual data value. You want to create a frequency that just tells you how many are in a specific category. And as far as categories concerned, we usually in statistics call this a class. So a class is just another term.
for category in a distribution. And simply because you can have different categories for different classes, so we want to veer away from the term category when we're referring to classes. So this is a class. These are classes. Within this class of A's, there are different categories, right? We could have A minus, or let's use B. That's a better example. We could have B minus, a regular B, a B plus. Not here in this class, obviously, our statistics class. But in other classes, you might see those distinctions. And so when we need more levels of structure, this is what we do. We use the term class to represent these instead of that word category. Now, classes have a bunch of definitions that go with it. One is class limits. So there are two class limits. There's the upper class limit. and the lower class limit. And these are fairly straightforward. They give you the upper bounds. Now, not every class, if it's a qualitative class, A, B, C, D, F, has upper and lower bounds that we write explicitly, but there is a implicit upper and lower class limit to those. We all know to get an A, you have to get 90 to 100. Now we don't write those here, but we'll talk about extended distributions in a little bit here. You could extend this particular frequency distribution to tell you that information. We also have class width. This is the difference between the upper and lower class limits. So 50 to 59, the difference there is 9. 0 to 49, the difference there is 49. Now, we're going to talk a lot about how to choose class width and class limits to fit your data. But our next definition here is class boundaries. So the halfway mark between the upper limit of one class and the lower limit of the next class is our class boundary. And the way we find that is once you find the first class boundary, Your work is basically done. At that point, what we do is we add or subtract the class width to get the rest. So if you get your first class boundary is, let's say up here, the boundary between this class and the 60s class would be 59.5. That's halfway between 59 and 60. Our class width is 9. We would just, or our class width is 10 actually. We would just add 10 to each thing 59.5, 69.5, 79.5, and then we could go backwards 49.5. It's easy to figure out your class boundaries once you have one. You just have to make sure you get the first one correctly. <clears throat> we also have class midpoints. So this is pretty straightforward. It's the middle of any class. And we calculate this by taking the lower limit, add it to the upper limit, and divide by 2. So we're going to do a little example here constructing a frequency distribution for TV prices. So looking at these prices, I don't want to have to list all of these all the time. So we're going to create a grouped distribution, which means we're going to need some classes. And we're specifically going to use five classes.
And if we did this ungrouped, we would just be listing these over and over again. So that's what we're trying to avoid here. So now we want to decide how do we figure out what our class width should be. So how to decide class width. Well, it's a really simple idea. We take the lowest value and we subtract it from the highest value. So we do highest number minus lowest number. And then we divide by the total number of data points. So for us, our highest value, I've set this up in an ordered array, is 1999 minus 1595 divided by put data points, total number of classes, I'm sorry, divided by 5. And when you do that, we get 80.8. .8. Now this is money, so we're going to round this off to 81. And so now once you have this number here, you need to look at it and say, does this make sense for our data values? Does $81 make sense? If you were looking at a bunch of list of prices, would you want to have to check the difference in $81, every $81, which one's false? The answer here is not really. We typically do increments of 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. We like our powers of 10. So we're going to create a frequency distribution, and I'm going to start at the highest. So the highest value is 1999. And that's going to begin at 1900. Now, if you're wondering, I said $100 and I have 1900 to 1999. Well, we want every single dollar. And if we subtract 100, we're actually looking at 101 values. So think about, just as a little aside here to make sense of this, if I get, say, how many numbers are there from 1 to 100? You instinctively know that that is 100 numbers. But if you did the subtraction, you get 99. Even though you know, or that makes sense, but if you did 0 to 100, which is where we would start at $0 for increments of 100, this if this had 100, and we confirm that with the 99 here, that means that this has 101. So if we did 1899 to 1999, we would essentially be including that zero in this range. So if you ever want to know how many numbers there are, so the numbers, the number, of values from A to B is B minus A plus 1. And that's just an interesting kind of property of what we call the integers. So let's continue this on. So 1900, 1999. Now I have one class boundary. So you just subtract your class width, which we've decided to make 100. So 1800 to 1999, I'm sorry, 1899, 1700 to 1799, 1600 to 1699, and 1500 to 1599. And now I'm going to stop because we don't have any more data points. So we don't want our class, and this will be our frequency. We don't want to include classes that are just going to have zero in our frequency distributions. So 1900 to 1999, if we count up the numbers, we have five of those. 1800 to 1899, we have four. 1700 to 1799, we have six. 1600 to 1699, we have three. And 1500 to 1599, we have two. 
So this is our frequency distribution. We've just created our very own here. And what the rest of this section is looking at is extended distributions. So depending on what information is needed from a data set, you may construct a distribution that includes columns for things like class boundaries, class midpoints, um, uh, class, what else did we have? Boundaries, midpoints, limits, class limits, all that stuff can be added in more columns to the distribution. So I'm going to stop this video here. Like I said, I like to keep things to about 20-ish minutes, and we'll pick up with 2.1 Part 2 in the next video.